can't do that because I'm not a hoe. I said it just like that because that was my thought process. I am not a hoe. You know, he says, okay, well, let's talk about this. How many men had you slept with? You know, and up to this point, I had been with lots of men and he knew that already because I had already told him, I was already vulnerable and told him all of my life. He says, at least my girls are getting paid for what they do. You're not. So who's the real hoe? I was lured into sex trafficking when I was 18. And it started with just a couple of us friends wanting to go out to a senior trip. And uh, we were going to an amusement park and I didn't have a date. So I was set up with someone I didn't know. But it was okay because it was through my one of my friends. As we're at the, the amusement park, I, you know, I meet this guy and he is just amazing. He buys the things that I want and um, he was handsome and had this big beautiful smile and um, he was 28 and I was 18 at the time so to some it may seem like you know how could you be with someone who's so much older than you um, but for me I had already had a baby and um, I was already independent. I had my own place as I was um, exiting high school and preparing for college. And so for me, I felt that dating or even going out on this blind date with a 28 year old, it wasn't, you know, something I should, you know, just kind of look at and say, red flag, don't do it. So that didn't happen for me. After this date, we continued to, to talk on the phone. He lived in a different region than I did, so it was a long distance. But he made sure to just keep in touch with me, and then we started dating. So that is how it all started, and I, I stayed in it for about a year and a half. The faces of our pimps now are your everyday people. Back back in the old days, in the 80s and the 70s, and even in the 60s, your pimp was that guy who wore that bright suit with the hat and the feather coming out of it. You know, that's what we were used to seeing. Now it's just that guy that stands on the corner. It could be your neighbor that could be trafficking people because nothing says, hey, here I am trafficking people, come get me. I've been seeing a lot more females that are also participating in you know, taking these females and putting them on these websites and, and managing them. I have a female um, now who, um, she was being trafficked by her pimp. And her pimp had called and set up the date for her. And when the date got there, the pimp walked out the room and let the date go into the room. While the date was in the room with the victim, he robbed her, raped her, and wouldn't allow her to leave. And then after he was done, he walked out the room like everything was okay. The pimp didn't even stay around to find out what was going on. She just left the victim there. You know, don't tell the cops who I am. Don't say nothing. Um, the victim felt like, how can I go to the police and tell the police, hey, I put my, you know, I was posted on a website and a guy came to have sex with me for money and I was willing to do it but then he raped and robbed me so she was very reluctant to uh, even say anything to the police. They are trained and they are taught to um, disregard police and not to tell us what's going on that when you meet them, the first thing they say, I do this for myself. Oh, I, I post myself online. I make my own money. I don't have nobody that's um, taking care of me. I just do this all alone. When we, we know a lot of the, the, a lot of the sex um, trade is done through somebody else. There's, it's an organization that's being handled. And to hear a girl saying that she's doing everything on her own, a lot of times it's false. I did not realize it, that it was really here. It seemed so foreign to me, so far away, this idea that one human being controls another. We don't want to think of it as being here. 
but it is. And it merits our thoughtful, full, and appropriately forceful response and compassionate response for those who are the victims. We learned about sex trafficking or at least, um, in this area. Actually, my daughter wrote a paper as a sophomore in high school and um, opened my eyes because it wasn't a paper that was about trafficking someplace else. It was about trafficking happening here in the United States. And that floored me because I had worked in the public defender's office in Virginia Beach for a number of years back in the late 1990s up to 2000 and had represented women who had been uh, um, charged with prostitution but didn't have any clue really of even what the kinds of questions they asked that might have enabled me to learn that they were in fact not doing this willingly. When people are in um, situations where they're being sexually trafficked, quite often they've been targeted. And they've been targeted because somebody identified that they maybe have a scope of vulnerabilities, maybe a non-supportive household or some exposure to other risk factors, whether that's domestic violence, physical violence, sexual violence, in the instance of a young person or a teenager, maybe we have a situation where they didn't have the parental support and supervision that they needed, in which case that left them a little bit more vulnerable. You have to understand that when I was growing up, I was sexually abused by a family member from the time I was seven to 14. And so I hadn't had people in my life to support me and to just somebody to talk to and to really express myself. And so this guy, you know, he listened to me. He asked all the right questions about my life. They don't feel like they're victims because they make them feel like they're important. A lot of these victims come from broken homes and come from homes where um, they're not showed love or care. It's sort of like a gang member turns around and they get that love and, and they feel like they're wanted and they belong. And that's what these modern day pimps are doing now, making these women feel like they wanted and they belong. I can take care of you. You don't have to worry about me doing nothing to you or anything. And we can just make lots of money. And they make it seem like this glorious life. And they show them that. They show them that we can go to fine restaurants and buy fine clothes and jewelry. But yet, you still have to go out there and make money. It was never he lured me. It was never he coerced me or it was, it was never he manipulated me. The way he turned it around made it seem like um, it was my job to keep our relationship together or um, to maintain my queen status, I needed to make more money. And so me walking into it, I said yes. I said yes to my relationship with him. I said yes to what he asked me to do because what he asked me to do was partner with him and I thought that that's what I needed to do to keep my relationship with him. So the, the entire time that um, I was being trafficked, that was my mindset. We often get asked about, you know, well, how often is this happening? What, what are the statistics? You know, how many people are actually being trafficked in our area? How many labor trafficking victims? How many sex trafficking victims? And um, how do we codify those numbers? It's a tricky question to ask because this is a, a, a crime that fo now floats under the radar. People are actively trying to cover up this crime so that they may continue to profit from it. And so it's a mobile crime. It tends to move. If you consider even the region that we're in, it's a perfect storm for kind of maybe keeping this hidden. We have the interstates, which we're a part of. We have the ports. We have uh, the naval bases and such. We have the tourist season. So it's not always easy to tell statistics. We can look at, like, Polaris's National Human Trafficking Hotline, and we can begin to see the number of calls that come into our region that are related to trafficking and around the state. Our region has one of the highest call volumes in the state for either people asking questions about what they're seeing is whether it's trafficking or not, or potential actual trafficking situations with Northern Virginia and Richmond. But it's, it's up and down the I-95 corridors, up and down I-81, and even you'll see pockets of calls all across the state because it's really happening everywhere. I first became aware of human trafficking through the military, actually. I was a, deployed to Iraq as a company commander, and we had human trafficking as a worldwide uh, phenomena. And we learned about it 
um, in, this, in the traditional sense of people who were sold into slavery and moved to other countries. So when I came back to the police department, uh, I, I got this position with the uh, Organized Crime Division. Prostitution and human trafficking were kind of looked at as two separate things. And through my experience and through the detectives and uh, through working with other agencies, um, you know, we found that it's the same thing. In Newport News, we've long had a problem with streetwalkers. So we have been doing prostitution operations for a long time. We still do have streetwalkers and street-level prostitution, and we deal with that as, 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 as it becomes necessary. The paradigm shift, if you will, over the last 10 years is for all this to go onto the Internet. It's just so available. You don't have to put yourself out there. All you have to do is turn around and get on a website and you can buy anything you want. It's like if you go to Craigslist or Backpage, you can turn around and buy a stereo if you want a stereo today. Well, that's what sex has become. It's become where you can get online and you can just purchase sex. It's easy. You can have someone come to your house and they'll come to your house for as long as you want them to and then they leave. You don't, you're not seen out there picking up um, females off the street and you know it's less of a chance of the police officers catching you when you're doing this in your home or going somewhere else to meet somebody. It's a lot more private than it is being out there and picking up girls on the street. The danger of it is these girls are getting raped, they're getting robbed, they're getting beat up. You know you go to a guy's house you don't know what you're walking into and you as a, as a male who call these females you don't know what's walking into your door. You might have a female come to your house and walk into your door and the next thing you know, two guys are right behind her busting your door down and they're robbing you. And how do you call the police and say, hey, I just got on Backpage. I ordered a girl to have sex with and two of her friends robbed me. It, it, society is going to look at that and be like, come on. And it's the same thing with these females. These females need to be careful because you don't know what door you're walking into. Think about all these um, registered sex offenders that can easily get on one of these websites, call somebody, have you come to their house, and take advantage of you. They can rape you, and even to the point of killing you. It is dangerous to just walk someplace where you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's on the other side of that door. It's growing in the fact that they can market the product you know, a lot easier than before, and not out of the public view. So a a community that is used to seeing street prostitutes that sees less street walkers might think that there's not a problem or might not be aware of the problem whereas it's actually moved to the internet and to the hotels and to you know apartments that are abandoned or whatever a lot of the the lower lower end hotels that maybe will take cash um, it's easier for them to go into a room under an anonymous name and use that room for two or three nights where a pimp could have two or three girls in that in that room or several rooms we've encountered you know, there were several girls staying in, in one hotel there was one room where they were doing their business at once it got hot so to speak if we got onto them or we did an operation or they sensed that we were on to them they would pick them up and move to another hotel and that goes back to the challenges they usually that hotel isn't in Newport News it'll be Hampton Virginia Beach or Norfolk I never knew where we were going to go so I would say that would be typical it would be that I didn't know if we were going to sh truck stops. I didn't know if we were going out of state. I didn't know when we would get sleep. I didn't know how, when I would come back home. It was always up in the air and it was always up to my pimp. Or he made us think it was always up to how much money we made. You guys can go home once you've made X amount of money. My son, he was just a few months old when I started. And so the pimp had night care for, for kids. They had night care for kids. And so we would drop our kids off before we left. I did have a relationship with my sister. She would love the chance of babysitting my son, so um, there will be times when I would just, you know, call my mom and say, hey, you know, can I borrow my sister, you know, for the weekend? And so there were times that he was safe home, and then there were times where uh, she couldn't babysit, and then I would um, take him to the night care to provide it for us.
the more I'm getting deeper into this, the more controlling into my life, into the details of my life he's getting. Pimps are very intuitive, you know, and it's a money-making business for them. They are serious about their money. The pimp that I had, he's a, a, one would call a daddy. You know, he was our daddy and that's what we called him. We called him daddy. He took care of his girls and that was his way of taking care of us, taking care of our bills too or whatever we needed. He wanted to know what we needed, what we needed it for. They hold things over their heads like when you have illegal um, women that come to this country, they hold their documentation over their head to turn around and let them know, well, if you, if you tell on me or if you try to run away from me, you'll have nothing. Some of them threaten families and, you know, they let them know that if you leave me, I'll go to your family and, and they threaten like their siblings or mother and father and that scares these females into wanting to be able to tell what's going on because they know that this pimp has that hold over them. Some of the exposure that we've had as a culture to some of the um, media images of people having been trafficked have uh, kind of set us up to, to think of it only one way. So again, some of the media images might uh, involve someone being held captive, literally, you know, in bondage or kept away, you know, in a dark room or shackled. And that's not always the case. The unfortunate impact of that media exposure is if we don't see those same scenarios being depicted, sometimes we don't have the same type of empathic response as we should. We begin to say, well, if the person had an opportunity to, you know, get away or if they weren't really being held physically captive, then they somehow must have wanted to be there. And None of the above is true. We understand, again, that if a person has a history of um, vulnerabilities and those um, have been taken advantage of or put in situations where they felt incredibly empowered, over time, it's reasonable to imagine that the person may have felt so disempowered that they wouldn't be inclined to, to fight against the situation. It can be so challenging to reverse the thought pattern of a person who's, who's experiencing um, trafficking because this experience in some ways is not so significantly different than previous experiences. I don't think that most individuals who come to counseling really get that they have been trafficked. I think they may in some instances feel that um, this is my life. Signs of someone being trafficked is not having an ID, no documentations if they're illegal, um, not knowing where they're at. You know, you ask them what city you're in. Oh, I know I'm in Virginia. Or what part of Virginia are you in? Um, it's near Virginia Beach and they can be in Newport News. Because um, a lot of these women that are being trafficked are taken up and down the East Coast or the West Coast or across the country to um, perform these sexual acts. We need to be more tuned to the signs of, of human trafficking, of sex trafficking. Not, not only the professionals who deal with it every day, but I think the general public. Sometimes it can happen to a person close to you and you begin to see beginning signs. And we're looking at the young people around us because they're a, a, a targeted population, our middle school students, our high school students. When you consider the average age of somebody being lured into sex trafficking um, is 13 for a young woman and even younger for a, a boy. Very few individuals are pulled in um, kind of sight unseen, if you will, that there's been some, um, some, some courting and somebody paying attention to you and certainly seeking the more vulnerable individual. And those would be individuals who don't have a, a strong, consistent support system that is kind of blocking um, someone's access. We tell our kids to not talk to strangers. But you have this, this girl who goes to the mall over and over again every weekend, and she sees this cute guy, and these girls are always all around him, and she wants to be a part of that. She wants to be noticed, you know? And she sees him every weekend. So the day he comes up to her, or the day she goes over to him, he's no longer a stranger because she sees him there all the time. He seems safe. 
So say somebody in your circle, somebody you're uh, close to, a friend or potentially a coworker, you know, where you begin to see things changing, like uh, they begin to wear expensive clothing that suddenly don't seem to be in their kind of budget and in their family budget, uh, jewelry that aren't explainable, expensive items. They begin uh, hanging around what seems to be an older boyfriend or somebody that's you know, several years older than them. Or they begin moving away from friendships that they've had. They start pulling away from you even though you're a good friend and um, start talking, hanging around different people that weren't there before. Traffickers are always looking for ways to keep their, um, their, their family full so that they're always making a certain amount of dollar every night, every week. They're making sure that income is coming in. It's important for parents to to not only know where your kids are going, because you could hear your you could hear your child say, "Mom, I'm going to Samantha's house tonight," and mom may say, "Oh yeah, I know who Samantha is." You know, my advice to parents would be check on Samantha, make sure you know who Samantha is and where your child is going. You know, because Samantha could be linked with someone else, and it's just not a a, a could be, because these are real stories. These are things that ha ha has really happened where we find. These kids are being trafficked just on the weekends, and then they go back home Monday through Friday, going to school. But you'll notice some things, like maybe they're overtired all of a sudden, or their grades drop dramatically. And so sometimes it just be a matter of get yourself aware, find out you know, what's going on, right? learn the signs and such, and then look in your world where it may be happening, because I can guarantee you it's very likely that somewhere in your world, just it may just that be the young man being brought to your door with selling magazines, it may be that student in your school, it may be that fellow employee on your job. As you become aware and you begin willing to answer questions, you can become one. And you have gifts that can be brought to the battle. So just look where you can apply those gifts and uh, go do it.